The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Can art survive the internet? Can artists make it in the world of free that's enabled by it? Tonight, writer and critic William Derezowitz explains why those are urgent questions before, during, and after the COVID-19 era. First up, Jessica J. Lee's moving, genre-defying travelogue won this year's Hillary Weston Writers' Trust Prize for nonfiction. And she tells us why botany and genealogy made her fall in love with Taiwan. It's Monday, November 30th, and that's next on The Agenda. Every family has its own story where geography and memory intertwine and leave a trail for future generations. But not every family tells its story, and certainly few have the kind of interlocutor that Jessica J. Lee's family has. In her most recent book, Two Trees Make a Forest, she sets out to discover her grandfather's past in Taiwan and in the telling offers something of a meditation on identity and roots, the meaning of home and homelands. The book was awarded the 2020 Hillary Weston Writers' Trust Prize for Nonfiction, and it brings Jessica Lee to our airwaves tonight from London, UK. Well, I not only need to welcome you, I need to congratulate you. That's a terrific honor for you, so congrats, and how does that all feel? Thank you. Um, I feel like I'm still processing it, to be honest. It's, <laughs> I've known now for a couple of weeks, and I it's such a life-changing award that I feel like I remember it again every few hours, and I'm just completely gobsmacked. <laughs> it's a lot of money that goes with it, too, isn't there? It's a ridiculous amount of money. <laughs> About 60 grand, I think, isn't it? Yeah, it's $60,000, which I think, you know, for someone of my generation particularly, I'm very mid-millennial in my 30s, and as a writer, you know, it's not a lucrative career, so that's game-changing, genuinely. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. Good for you. You deserve it. Your book, as we suggested, is sort of part memoir and part travelogue, and you are, of course, at the heart of the book. Uh, so I want to start by talking about you, because your bio describes you as part British Columbian, part Canadian, part Taiwanese. How did you end up with that triple identity? Um, yeah, so it's part British, part Canadian, part Taiwanese. Excuse me, um, part British, that's, that's okay. right. Yeah, my, so my dad is Welsh, and he uh, emigrated in the 70s, and my mom grew up in Taiwan. And then, yeah, I was born in Canada, grew up there, and um, I've lived in the UK on and off for most of my adult life. I did a stint in Germany for a while there, so it's I'm very much, um, uh, I think you know, of sort of multiple heritage, and, and I really draw on all of them in my work. Yes, you do. You're sort of from all over the place. You grew up in London, Ontario, only about two hours from where I'm sitting right now. But it's uh, it's the grandparents' bungalow in Niagara Falls that gets a great deal of attention. How come? Well, I think because my, my grandparents, um, you know, as long as I remember in my childhood, they lived in this, in this little bungalow in Niagara Falls. And it felt for me a little bit like an island, I guess you could say. It was the only place where I went where we, as a family, all spoke Chinese. Uh, we spoke in Mandarin. And, you know, we didn't have any other extended family um, on, on my mom's side. So, it, you know, it was in many ways literally a bit of a family island. That was where that entire side of our family and our family story and our family history on my mom's side was located, was sort of in the space of that bungalow. And so it's just... It's a site of really potent memory for me. Um, you know, I, I imagine every detail of that home in such great detail, even still many years later. So you did speak Chinese to, you spoke Mandarin Chinese to your grandparents, but then, but then you dropped out of uh, Saturday morning Chinese language school. How come? I think, you know, I've heard this actually from a lot of friends as well. You know, it's never fun to have to go to school on a Saturday when you're growing up. Um, so I think there's that element to it. But also, you know, I really struggled. I was the only uh, mixed race uh, child in the class that I was going to. And we didn't speak um, Mandarin regularly at home day to day. We spoke English at home. So I was I was far behind the level of most of the other kids. And I just didn't feel... I didn't feel very excited about it when I went, to be honest. I couldn't keep up. I had no idea what was going on half the time. And even at a young age, you know, I really, I felt quite unhappy with that. Um, although now as an adult looking back, I really wish that I'd stuck it out. I wish I'd been forced to stick it out, actually. Well, if we plunked you into the middle of Beijing or Shanghai today, how would you do? 
uh, I would be able to order food and probably navigate, uh, you know, tell a taxi where I needed to go, have a very basic conversation. But, you know, my time in Taiwan working on the book in particular, that was always illustrative to me because people would compliment me on my language skills. They'd say, oh, wow, for a foreigner, you speak really wonderful Mandarin. <laughs> And then as soon as I said, oh, well, my mom is Taiwanese, they would say, well, then why is your Mandarin so poor? <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and as it happens, through the course of this, you also develop a passion for reading about nature. Where'd that come from? Well, I'm trained as an environmental historian. I work um, uh, I work at the University of Cambridge now and as, as a historian. And so I have, for a very long time, had a passion for landscape and sort of histories of how plants have moved around the world, how we've shaped nature, um, sort of from a cultural perspective. And so I think when I started spending time in Taiwan, it made sense to me to explore that. And also, I was just completely drawn to the sort of remarkable landscapes that are there. The hiking is incredible. The beaches are incredible. Um, you know, there's just so much biodiversity. And so it was a really sort of natural choice for me. Let's do a little more family history here. Your grandparents and your mother leave Taiwan for Canada in 1974. How come? That's right. Um, so my grandfather had been retired for a while from the Air Force at that stage, and he really missed flying. Um, he was a pilot all his life and was very passionate about it. And he'd been told uh, by other colleagues of his that if, you know, if he moved to Canada, um, he could get a job flying commercially. Uh, unfortunately, that was not the case. And they did move. They moved the whole family over. And he was told he would have to wait for five years to get flight clearance, at which point he would have been too old to fly. So he and my grandmother spent their retirement working as janitors at the Chef Boyardee factory in Niagara Falls. And is that part of the reason why, I mean, Canada never really worked all that great for your grandmother, did it? You write in the book, I think, she never really felt rooted in the place. Is that part of the reason why? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that it's really a common story for a lot of immigrant families. I don't think it was that unique, but I think, you know, it wasn't a... a a fortuitous beginning, I guess you could say. And, you know, I think because we, we don't have extended family here, um, you know, th there was that obstacle to feeling connected to being in Canada and to feeling really rooted. And also, I think my family just doesn't like the weather. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not alone in that. Uh, in, in many respects, the, this book does read as a kind of a tribute to your grandparents. And uh, I guess I want to know why, why you felt so compelled to write something about them. Well, I mean, I, I think it was a long time coming and, and part of it was my own as an adult, like in adulthood, coming to grips with mixed race identity, with wanting to, to know more about um, my mother's past and my grandparents past that I had never asked before. Um, but in many ways, you know, there was an aspect of trying to make up for for stories lost and years lost, conversations lost that, you know, had I worked harder at speaking Mandarin, had I asked more questions in childhood, I might have been able to sort of gather these stories um, at, at an earlier stage. And and so the book, in some ways, is compensation, I think, and and you know, it was also a, an opportunity to to spend more time with my grandparents even after their deaths, if that makes sense, to, to really sort of have a conversation with them that continued even though they were gone. No, of course it makes sense. And and in, in many ways, the story of your grandparents is very much the story of China and its relationship with Taiwan through the 20th century. Your, your grandparents are from China originally, end up in Taiwan. Maybe just sort of sketch the details of how they got from A to B. Yeah, um, so my grandparents were part of the generation uh, in Taiwan known as Wai Shangren, which are um, the people from the mainland who came at the end of the Chinese Civil War um, and and sort of fled to Taiwan uh, because they were on the nationalist side of the Civil War. As um, opposed to so the my, communists. We're, we're talking late exactly. 1940s here. Exactly. So after the Second World War was over, the Chinese Civil War continued. Um, my grandfather was in the Air Force, and he was stationed in Taiwan in 1947. And then my grandmother left Nanjing, China in 1949, uh, thinking she was leaving China just temporarily, um, just for safety as the war continued, not knowing that she would never return again and she would never see her entire family again and would be in Taiwan, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future. Now, Nanjing has a place in history, of course, because it is notorious for being the place where, you know, the Japanese invaded in 1937 and murdered and pillaged and raped um, horrifically. And I, uh, 
your grandmother, how does she, how does she relate those times? Um, so my grandmother didn't talk about this throughout my childhood, and I sort of only knew it in sketches, sort of in the background. Um, and then in my early 20s, I sat down with her and I recorded a series of interviews in which I asked her what had happened and what she had seen and witnessed throughout uh, that period of, of um, the Second World War and the Second uh, Sino-Japanese War. And, you know, she told me, for the most part, she did, you know, her family, they, they fled, they were to, able to escape to stay with family in a neighboring province. But despite that, what they witnessed along the way was completely horrific. Um, you know, they were often having to, to take cover, flee and take cover from um, bombing raids. Um, she relates one scene, which is actually quite, quite brutal and quite graphic in which, you know, she encounters Japanese soldiers. She's with two other women and those women are killed. Um, so I had the sort of challenge in writing the book of, of taking this really weighty material that in many ways I didn't even want to, I, I didn't want to touch. It was too, too difficult sometimes to, to even think about and, and to find ways to put it on the page. Now, Jessica, do not interpret this next question as criticism. It's just an inquiry, okay? Okay. Uh, okay, I'm into politics. Full disclosure, your grandmother worked as the secretary for Chiang Kai-shek, who's one of the most important figures in the history of the world. Admittedly, he's on the losing end of the Chinese Civil War, but still, he's a huge figure in history. And you barely refer to that at all in the course of the book, whereas on the other hand, you talk a great deal about you know, descriptions of landscapes in Taiwan and so on and so forth. Explain. So part of that was, um, it was intentional in some ways and also dealing with the limitations of re research. Um, my grandparents were both part of the military and the government during the period of Taiwanese martial law, which was number one, um, a period that, you know, to this day, a lot of those records are under closure and very hard to access. Number two was also a period that now and in, you know, since the 90s has been sort of reflected upon as as quite complicated and detrimental for the majority of people in Taiwan. A lot of people were imprisoned, persecuted, killed, executed, um, experienced sort of, you know, quite horrific restrictions on, on daily life. So there was a part of me that wanted to make space for that part of the history, while also, I think, maybe dealing with my own feelings about my grandparents being part of that generation. Um, so there was that component of it. But also, I realized that I would never be able to tell that full story. I didn't have their words. Um, and that wasn't really the story that I set out to tell because I wanted to tell a story that was about a connection to place. Um, and that for me, you know, I would always approach it from, from the, the lens of landscape and nature. Um, so it made a lot more sense for me to sort of hone in on the small details of landscape and of place and of, of the very particular details of my family's story in order to point to the wider things, right? To point to the wider political story because they were individual actors that were caught up in something far larger than them. So it made more sense to me, you know, I wasn't writing a history textbook. I wasn't writing a book where, you know, I think there, there would be authors that perhaps would tell the wider history and the political history much more thoroughly. I wanted to hone in on that sort of very personal, very familial and intimate storyline against that that wider background, if that makes sense. It totally does. I get you. And mind you, you, you do kind of describe your grandmother as being irascible, difficult, not all that likable. Um, why'd you put all that on the record? Well, I think there was there was no way not to, and I, I would like to think that she would she would at least see it as I you know what I have done as as fairly generous. Um, you know, I think there's always difficulty speaking about you know trauma in families, uh, difficult experiences, and and mental and emotional difficulties in family. With my grandmother, it was important for me to be honest about who she was in my childhood and, and my growing up, because I also needed to set that in context. She experienced horrific things through the war. She lost her entire family at the end of the Chinese Civil War. She never got to go back to see them. And when I actually set her behavior in the context of, of that knowledge, it makes a lot more sense to me, if that makes sense. Sure. Um, you know, it was really important to sort of allow the whole emotional experience that she went to to sort of inform my my painting of her as character. Now, remind me, what was the first year that you went uh, with your mother to Taiwan to see it eventually? 
Um, so we went when I was a baby, and then I, in adulthood, we went again in 2013. 2013. Um, okay, so fairly recently, and and uh, obviously the baby part you don't remember at all. But but the uh, the 2013 trip, the stories you had heard about this place, compared to what you were now seeing firsthand as an adult person, talk about the difference. I think I had spent my entire childhood constructing this idea of Taiwan that was just from my mother's stories, right? And so I had a very limited picture. I didn't, I didn't really know what the landscape was like. Um, I pictured always in Taipei this sort of one hillside where my mother went to school at the top of the hill, and there would be street vendors all the way down the hill, and then the apartment she lived in, and that was all I could picture for years. There were no plants. There were no real other people. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a populated, vibrant, living place because it, it wasn't real, right? It was this imagined space. Um, and then when, when we arrived in Taiwan again, and I was confronted with the reality of, you know, an incredibly developed city, um, plant life that just exceeds what you would ever see um, in, you know, in more temperate climates, uh, I was just completely, you know, that, that original picture I had from childhood from my mother's stories was obliterated in some way um, and replaced with this thing that was just so much more vibrant, so much more vital and exciting to me. Well, here's where we get into more of the travelogue aspect of the story. And, and that's because Taiwan, as you describe it, is one of the most densely populated parts of the region and yet also a very turbulent country and yet also a country, 60% of which is covered in forest. So add all that up. What does that what does that lead us to? Well, I think it you know as a, as a nature writer approaching it from my perspective, um, it was really exciting because you got you get in Taiwan a really clear distinction between the cities and the countryside. Um, it's you know the cities are super densely populated um, and you know they're very exciting modern cities. Um, but the second you step into the mountains, you're dealing with roads that. If there's an earthquake that week, you might not be able to get up the side of the mountain. You, you're going to be waiting for the thing, like the one road up the mountain, to be repaired. Um, you're dealing with, you know, some of the best um, uh, hiking trails, the highest mountains in East Asia. So, you know, quite remote landscapes that seem to appear almost out of nowhere because Taiwan's a very narrow island, right? It's it's about 89 miles wide, and so you're going from sea level to 4,000 meters very, very quickly. Um, so I find, you know, it, it's just this place of contrasts, which as a, as a writer, I find really productive. And, you know, in the cities as well, though they're very densely populated and very modern cities, they're also filled with plant life. They're filled with, you know, just trees that grow off the sides of buildings. <laughs> <laughs> I do need to ask you a bit of a political question here. And again, we're going to go back to, I'll do the, the 20 second historical recap here. Uh, late 1940s, nationalists leave mainland China for Taiwan, communists take charge of mainland China. And, and sort of ever since, there's been this very awkward, tense, cold peace, I guess, between the mainland and Taiwan. And we've certainly heard predictions for the last number of decades uh, that ask the question, how much longer are the mainland Chinese, the communist Chinese, uh, going to put up with the independence of little Taiwan? And I guess what I want to know from you is, how concerned are you about the future independence of Taiwan. I'm very concerned. Um, working on this book, I think, really magnified that concern for me. Um, but it also, in some sense, gave me a lot of hope because I was meeting a lot of, uh, you know, the young generation in Taiwan, young activists, you know, even non-activists, you know, the, the young generation was very politically engaged amongst everyone I met. And there was a real sense of, of care and concern and solidarity for like um, also for places like Hong Kong as well, where the status is, you know, it, it's the situation is far farther progressed, of course. Um, but yeah, it, you know, there was there's such a strong support for for Taiwan as a country to be recognized as a country, which de facto, you know, it functions as a country. Um, and, and so, the, you know, seeing how politically engaged people were, um, even from a young age in Taiwan, I found really heartening, I think, because it's so easy to become, I think, quite pessimistic and quite overwhelmed by the gravity of, of thinking of, of, of Taiwan sort of in relation to a, um, its much larger neighbor. Um, so, I mean, you say that there's still support for an independent Taiwan, and there is to a certain extent, but as one looks around the world, you know, virtually every country in the world is 
you know, forgive my using the vernacular here, sucking up to China for commercial reasons, that Taiwan doesn't have nearly the support that it did, you know, 40, 50 years ago. You worried about that? Um, absolutely. I think, you know, we've seen, particularly over the past year, we've seen this become a really magnified problem with um, with COVID in particular. Like Taiwan has handled COVID very, very well um, and was among the first to, to alert the World Health Organization, for example, that there was a problem. Um, but because of the lack of recognition of, of Taiwan, um, those warnings weren't heeded properly. But also, I think a lot of countries have not been able to learn uh, from the good practice that has been taking place in Taiwan this year. Um, it, you know, there's just so much that the country has to offer. And I, I think it's a real pity that, um, you know, for political reasons, we're not seeing um, the level of, of relation uh, and sort of, sort of uh, political relationships and um, exchange that could be possible. Let's, in our remaining moments here, read an excerpt from the book, and then I'll ask you a couple questions coming out of this. Sheldon, if you would, let's bring this excerpt up. In my childhood, I heard phrases like, Taiwan, the true China, or Chinese, but from Taiwan, and rarely felt pressed to make sense of them. The task of naming so often exceeded me. I do not know why we did not visit Taiwan during my childhood, and I never asked. Instead, I negotiated the world as a dual citizen of Britain and Canada, casting my life in those frames of reference. The question of whether to call myself Taiwanese or Chinese felt a complication too far. I often found myself with too many names, too many homes, and no fixed sense of which order to arrange them in. That's complicated, Jessica. Is it getting any easier? Definitely. I think, you know, this book was the book I needed to write in order to work through that because I grew up, you know, I grew up um, as diaspora, it, you know, with my mom being a generation that was raised under martial law. So there wasn't a lot of space for conversations about identity in, you know, in the culture in which she grew up. And so it's something I've had to learn a lot about uh, on my own, sort of as, um, you know, first generation Canadian and, um, you know, as, as Taiwanese diaspora to think, okay, the names I choose, the the language with which I describe myself, that is political. It it has implications, and that I I need to think really carefully about about what I say. Well, you say in the book, I developed a love for these mountains and their forests, a need to return and return again. Why these mountains? Why these forests? It's just there's so much history in Taiwan. There's so much uh, sort of vitality of life. The level of biodiversity. Was incredible, but I think, you know, in many ways for me it was uh, it was simply emotional. I would go into the mountains with my mother, and I would say, I don't know what these trees are, I don't know what these plants are, and you know, for me as an environmental historian, that's a, a strong admission because I like to know what the names of plants are. Um, but my mom would point to them and she would say, oh, you know, that's this plant, that's that plant, and I, I would then say, oh, well, how do you know that? And she would say, well, your grandfather taught me, and that for me was a really beautiful thing to think that you know, getting to know the land in Taiwan was actually a kind of inheritance and a kind of continuity um, intergenerationally. And so it meant a lot to me. And I think that really shaped my experience of, of moving through the landscape there. I'm going to use another political metaphor here to set up the next question. And in doing so, I'm going to quote British author David Goodhart, who coined the term somewheres and anywheres to explain the difference in the sort of the Brexit vote. You know, the people who feel rooted to somewhere and the people who are essentially content to live anywhere. Uh, I guess the question for you is, are you an anywhere who's trying to find a place somewhere? You know, I, I don't think I'm an anywheres. I think actually I'm, if we can say somewhere, plurally, somewheres. I think, you know, people often ask me, well, where's home? Where do you belong to? And my answer to that is always, if you are asking that question, wanting me to give you a single place, I refuse the question. <laughs> but if I can answer it and say all of these places are places that matter to me, you know, I, I was born in Canada and my dad's Welsh, my mom's Taiwanese. I've lived across these places. Then that's the answer that that sort of is most honest. I think, you know, I, I refuse. I refuse the choice. <laughs> well, can you imagine living in Taiwan someday and calling that place oh. home? It's a dream. Genuinely, it's a dream. If I could make it work professionally, I'd be there in an instant. <laughs> well, you got enough money for airfare now, that's for sure. <laughs> Certainly. I, I think, though, uh, my employers might have other thoughts on that. <laughs> I hear you. 
Well, we congratulate you again on winning this Writers Trust Prize. It's a terrific honor for you. Two trees make a forest in search of my family's past among Taiwan's mountains and coasts. Jessica J. Lee, thanks so much for joining us from London, UK tonight. It's really great to meet you. Thank you for having me. It's great to meet you. Tomorrow on the agenda. I didn't follow all of the guidelines. I ended up getting HIV. And around COVID, I'm, I'm really um, careful about, about what I do because of my first experience. I don't want to get COVID. I don't want to pass COVID on. And, you know, I, I see a, um, a lot of people doing the right thing and being very responsible. But I, and I even see some stigma with COVID where, you know, there are some people who I know who got COVID and they don't want to tell anybody that they got it. That's tomorrow on the agenda. If everyone is an artist, is anyone really an artist? And if artists are indeed a dime a dozen, how could any of them make a living in such a crowded marketplace? Throw in the digital revolution and such questions, often viewed as unseemly by true artists, become inevitable. Essayist and critic William Derezowitz faces them squarely in his new book, the Death of the Artist, How Creators Are Struggling to Survive in the Age of Billionaires and Big Tech. And he joins us now from Portland, Oregon. We're delighted to have you on TVO tonight, Bill. How are you doing? I'm happy to be joining you. Thank you. Excellent. Now, we should state off the top that, that you wrote this book before the pandemic hit. And there's no doubt that COVID-19 has had a significant, massive impact on, on the arts, on artists, and so on, and their livelihoods. But be that as it may, let's start with the title of your book. You talk about the death of the artist, and it, it seems to me that there are more artists around now than ever. So what do you mean the death of the artist? That's a good question. I mean, one way to answer that is that it's a death of a certain kind of uh, vision for what an artist's life can be. Because, uh, yes, there are more artists around than ever, and that's one of the reasons that it's harder and harder for any artist to make a decent living. I mean, basically, before the Internet came along, it was certainly hard to make his living as an artist, that's been true for a long time. But if you manage to be one of the relatively few who established a real professional career, who stuck with it, who did it seriously, who achieved some level of re recognition, not superstar status, but recognition from peers, from critics, you found an audience, you produced consistently, that was a middle class job description, basically. You know, you could uh, afford a decent place to live, decent health care, maybe send your kids to college. The way the Internet and other factors, growing inequality especially, has reshaped the economics of the arts, that has largely become a working class job description. And at least in the United States, uh, working class today means poor. Well, let's That's set what up, artists are facing. Right. Let's set up this next question then with an excerpt from the book. And here it goes. The most important thing you write, the most important thing to understand about artistic success, however, is that it arrives with an expiration date. You have fans now. Your work is selling right now. The critics adore you for now. Artistic work is project to project. Your album or your play can make a splash, but then it's back to square one. The artist's life is feast or famine. You can find success again, and past successes help generate future ones, but there are no guarantees. We should say you interviewed almost 150 artists for this book. What do you think motivates people to want to do this work, given that, as you just point out, the odds of making a decent living are really quite infinitesimal? Well, the first thing that motivates them is just the sense that they were born to do this. I mean, that was a remarkably consistent thing I heard from artists. This is who I am. This is what I need to do. Some of them expressed it in terms of, I'm addicted, I'm damaged, I can't do anything else. But I think that's one of the remarkable things about artists, and that it tends not to be true of other lines of work, uh, that you just know that this is who you are and this is what you need to do. But I should also say, the way you ask that question, that another thing that continues to, to draw people into a field that's becoming increasingly difficult to survive in is uh, ignorance or illusion. I, I mean, I didn't write this book to discourage anyone from being an artist, far from it. But I did write it to help inform people and the rest of us what it takes and how hard it is. Partly because it's long been taboo to even talk about money in relation to the arts. Uh, and that taboo needs to be broken.
We will talk about money going forward, but but uh, m most of the authors I interview say th they didn't write a book for the for the paycheck. They wrote it because they had to write it, and that makes them an artist. Now you write books. Are you an artist? No, I'm not an artist because the books I write are not what I would call art. They're not fiction, poetry. I don't write screenplays. Uh, but my life as a freelance writer, uh, in practical terms, does resemble other writers and more broadly artists. Um, you make an important point. Artists, writers don't do this for the money. But like everybody else, they need money to do it because they need money to pay their bills. Uh, that's a really important distinction. Do we have too expansive an idea today of what constitutes creativity? Yes, I do. Th well, I think what's happened is that creativity has, in the last 20 years, again, largely under the influence of Silicon Valley, become a commercial concept, a business concept. You know, we talk about creatives now, the creative economy, creative cities, creative spaces, creative industries. And the result is that the specific form of creativity called art, which I think is different from other forms, has become submerged in a more general category that includes people who make food, people who write computer code. And what bothers me about that is, first of all, that what's distinctive about art gets lost, but also that art is becoming rewritten in commercial, in market terms. So yeah, I talk about how artists need to make a living, but I also talk about how the market has uh, sucked the arts into it to such an extent that the other motives for making art are becoming harder and harder to sustain. Well, here's another quote from the book that amplifies on what you just said. You write, the individual who runs around proclaiming their status as an artist marks themselves as either a dabbler, a poser, or mediocrity. So does the one who boasts about their talent. Serious artists are far too conscious of the record of achievement in their field. A number of my subjects said they prefer to see themselves as craftspeople. Artist has been soiled by all the dilettantes. Too many people out there thinking of themselves as artists. Is that the problem? I, well, it's one of the problems. I do think it is. Um, I don't mean to denigrate anybody's efforts, anybody's practice. But another thing that's happened, and again, it's been the influence of Silicon Valley, especially Apple, right? Apple had all these expensive machines they were trying to sell us, especially back in the 90s when Steve Jobs came back and the company was trying to claw its way back. And they were producing beautiful computers that cost a lot more than anybody else's. So they launched this ad campaign that said, basically they told everybody that they were an artist, that we were all these marvelous creative geniuses like Kerouac and Einstein, the people they put on their famous billboards. And they convinced everybody that they needed to buy those expensive machines to express their unique creativity. And in that wake has grown this entire creativity industry. Uh, there's even a category of book called creativity self-help, you know, self-help through creative expression. I think it has cheapened people's understanding of what it means to be an artist, what it takes to be an artist, how hard it is to be an artist. And that in turn is one of the things that's helped devalue our sense of what artists are owed, not just in terms of respect, but in terms of payment. Yeah. I, I mean, we I, have the sense that, you know, a lot of art is free now, right? Music mm -hmm. is free, video is free. We have also created a set of alibis, rationales that enable us to believe that it ought to be free. I do promise you we're going to get to the economic angle of this, but I still got other stuff to get to first. Sure. Namely, who, who then should be entitled to use that nomenclature? Listen, I'm not setting rules about who should be able to use it, but the passage you read indicates that a real artist, one of the characteristics of a real artist is that they're very reluctant to call themselves an artist because they know, because they have so much respect for the achievement in their field, uh, achievements in their field, because they feel that it's a term that needs to be earned, that needs to be conquered. So I'm not going to run around stopping people from calling themselves an artist. I would like the culture, the advertising business, to stop encouraging everybody to call themselves an artist. Listen, not everyone's an artist for the same reason not everyone's an athlete. You know, we're all born with a certain level of, with some level of creative ability, and we're all born with some level of athletic ability. Some of us aren't born with very much of either. <laughs> and few of us do the work to become real athletes, and few of us do the work to become real artists.
Well, we did touch on the main title of the book. Now I want to hit on the subtitle of the book, How Creators Are Struggling to Survive in the Age of Billionaires and Big Tech. In what way is big tech, you hinted at it a moment ago, but let's amplify on this. In what way is big tech making artists' survival more difficult? Oh, so many ways. Um, first of all, the way big tech, the big tech platforms have driven the price of digital content to zero or near zero. It started with Napster in music in 1999. Uh, Facebook does it. It has a ton of pirated content. Google makes a lot of its money from pirated content. Amazon has a lot of counterfeit books on its site, a lot of various shenanigans uh, that make it harder for publishers to survive and therefore for uh, writers to get decent advances. Google and Facebook have essentially taken the ad business away from journalism, which also makes it harder for writers to survive and for other people, illustrators who write, who uh, draw for magazines and so forth. The tech platforms have diverted on an ongoing basis tens of billions of dollars a year from creators, from the people who create the content that drives so much of their profits from the creators to them. And a big way they've done it is by selling us on this promise of free art, free everything. And for the consumer, it seems great, but we need to ask ourselves, like, if we're getting something of value for free, there's got to be a problem there. There's got to be a breakdown there. And the breakdown, the breaking point, is the artists themselves. So I think it really is hurting us as consumers because we're getting art that is necessarily made in haste, that is superficial. Um, artists can't, they're so busy struggling to survive, making stuff, marketing themselves, that the work they do inevitably suffers. Um, you, you make the argument very clearly in your book, but just for argument's sake, l let me push back with what um, the billionaires of today would say. David Geffen says, I, I spend 20% of my income on art. A uh, hundred years ago, the Carnegies were, you know, putting up libraries all over the place. Hundreds of years ago, the Medicis, the richest people of their day, were encouraging uh, so many uh, to create great art that has lasted for centuries. Are, are, are wealthy people not essential to the creation of uh, a whole artistic culture? I don't know that they are essential. They certainly have a role to play. I think the money that they divert to the arts is a small fraction of the money they take from the arts. But here's the real issue. Do we want the David Geffens of the world, today's Medicis and Carnegies, to be deciding what art we get to see? Because that's what we've come to. Uh, the middle class audience is being destroyed because the middle class is being destroyed. In any case, if they're not paying anything, they don't really have a role in deciding what gets seen. So it's the, it's the plutocrats who play an increasing role in sustaining uh, journalism, in sustaining the arts. I think that that's a profoundly dangerous situation. I think you also suggest, though, or I don't know, push back on me if you like, but one of the artists that you interviewed for this book said, you really can't win as an artist. Either you are a fraud, because you're not making enough money, or you're greedy because you're making too much money. Uh, speak to that conundrum, if you would. Right, right. That goes to the psychological issues that surround money and art, mm -hmm. and that many artists struggle with. And so many of the people I interviewed for the book were willing to talk to me about intimate details of their financial lives because they wanted to break through those resistances. So that, that person in particular, young animator, uh, who's spoken about this in public, about her conflicts with money, because you're supposedly not to think, supposed to think about money. You're not supposed to ask for money for your art. She feels shame about negotiating for her fees. She feels shame about not negotiating for her fees. Uh, she feels shame about taking public assistance because she feels like other people need it more. So by talking, by really talking about the fact that actually making art is work, making art should be remunerated in financial terms like any other work, we can help artists advocate for themselves better and stop torturing themselves for doing what they need to do. You know, we all got to make a living. So why does she, why is she so, um, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, conflicted by this paradox in her life. Yeah, because yeah, we, are, we all need to make a living, but this is something that people in the arts really don't talk about very much. I mean, in art schools, they don't talk about it. 
uh, the, the, so the, the whole myth that we really, it's the myth that we inherited from the Romantic Age from the 18th and 19th century that art, making art was a kind of new priesthood and money and any connection between money and art inevitably sullies the art. You're a sellout if you think about money. Um, that's, that's why people like her and so many others, uh, don't make the simple equation of like, I need to make a living. I'm making something of value for other people. They should pay me for it. I shouldn't have a problem with it. They shouldn't have a problem with it. The audience shouldn't have a problem with it. But unfortunately, things aren't that simple. Well, one way to take all of those sullying effects out of the equation is to have artists supported by the public. And uh, you do discuss this in your book, and you're not all that keen on the idea. How come? Yeah, I think it's complicated. Um, I think I would actually say even since I wrote the book, I've become a little more open to that, if only because I think we need an all-of-the-above solution. You know, we need to reform the markets. We need public funding to be better, certainly in America where it's absurdly small. It's like less than $2 billion a year at all levels of government. So I'm not against public funding as a general principle. I'm against it as a universal solution to this. And the reason I am is that public funding also has its own corruptions. Public funding, nonprofit funding, foundations, somebody decides who gets the money. And once that enters into it, you have cronyism, you have insiderism, you have all kinds of biases. Uh, and, you know, people who work in non the nonprofit sectors in the arts, they see this all the time. They understand this. That's why I don't think public funding is necessarily the the panacea that people might think it is. Not the panacea, but don't you have to pick your poison here? Either you get the cronyism or you get artists starving. Which would you prefer? What I would really prefer is that we reform the market so that artists can get paid again the way they deserve to. And those tens of billions of dollars that artists are generating that are going to the tech platforms flows back to artists. I mean, yes, public funding good, some level of philanthropy, plutocrats have some role to play, but mainly we need to create a market again that actually works for artists. And the main way to do that is to take on the tech platforms. How would you do that? Well, this is not my area of expertise, but you know, basically you, you break up these companies that have amassed, you know, that have been buying up other smaller companies and creating synergies that ena enable them to smother competition. And that so you break them up like we broke up the monopolies in Carnegie's day. And then the core platforms that can't be broken up should be treated like utilities, which can't be broken up, which means that they're regulated by the government. Maybe there's a rate setting commission for how much YouTube has to pay musicians for streaming rates. Right now, the rate is thought to be seven hundredths of a cent per stream on YouTube. And YouTube is like half of all music listening. So if your music is streamed a million times on YouTube, a million times, you get $700. Somebody needs to do something about that. <laughs> and I think that that somebody needs to be the government. Well, what if the government tries to do something about that and YouTube says, OK, fine, you want to mess with our profit system here? We just won't have those people on our, on our platform. And that's a loss for them because we won't be able to have the eyeballs on our product that we want to have. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't. I've never heard that suggestion because I think they still would make a ton of money. But that actually doesn't bother me at all. I mean, if you can't uh, listen to music on YouTube, you're not going to stop listening to music. You're going to go to a platform that pays musicians better. So I would love for YouTube to walk for Google. YouTube is Google. I would love for Google to walk away from from music streaming. Um, there, and why, I mean, why are the rates the lowest on YouTube? Because it's Google, because they're so powerful. They're the biggest lobbyist in Washington and have been for years. So, you know, make my day, walk away from music, YouTube. <laughs> oh, you're channeling Clint Eastwood now. Okay, I got there it. You go. uh, I'm just gonna say a note to our director here, Sheldon Osman. Sheldon, let's go to the bottom of page four here and bring up this uh, quote from the book earlier than was uh, anticipated, but since we're here right now, let's do it. What can be done? The devastation, you write, of the art economy is rooted in the great besetting sin of contemporary American society, extreme and growing inequality. To be middle class is more or less, by definition, to have disposable income. And when people get a little extra money, one of the things that they spend on is art. Money circulates within communities, but only if it's present in the first place. We do not need the government to pay for art or the rich with their philanthropy 
We only need each other. Draw that out if you would. How do you see that working? Right. So what I'm saying here is that while there are lots of things that need to be changed within the arts economy, unfortunately, the real solution it has to lie in reforming the entire economy. Because the basic problem is that it's hard to ask people, it's hard to ask people to pay more than they need to for art if you know if they don't have to. But it's hard to even force people to pay more for art if we could do that through government action. Because the middle class as a whole, not just the middle class of artists, the middle class as a whole is being decimated. It's being decimated by healthcare costs, housing costs, tuition costs, falling wages, you know, stagnant wages. That's what I'm saying, and that's the end of the book that you re read that passage from. Um, the real answer is to do the very difficult but necessary work of restoring an economy that works for everyone, that works for a middle class. I mean, historically, the great uh, audience for art in the last two, 300 years has been the middle class. It was the middle class that took art away from the Medicis and made an art that was more democratic in every sense that was no longer beholden to the ideologies of aristocratic patrons, to the church, to the Lord, to the king. We need to rebuild the middle class, and then we don't need to rely on, I think, government or philanthropy. We can rely on each other, which I think is the best situation. Even if we rebuild the middle class, we have still been under the impression for the last, who knows, 10, 15 years, that we're entitled to a culture of free. And if I may say, I don't mean to pick on them because I know many of them are having a tough time eking out a living under the current circumstances. Millennials in particular think that they are entitled to everything for free. What do we do about that? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't want to pretend to have an easy answer to that. I mean, I think uh, culture and psychology are very hard to change. So I think wagging your finger at millennials and saying, you know, you should pay for art uh, is likely to have limited effect. But again, one of the reasons that things can be free is because of the way the market is structured. So this enormous amount of piracy that Google and other platforms condone and encourage, uh, they, they can put a stop to that if they were forced to do that. Um, if we, uh, you know, I mean, if we change streaming rates, uh, it might be that Spotify has to go out of business, but Spotify's model depends on underpaying artists. So I guess what I'm saying is, you're not gonna get people to voluntarily stop taking free stuff, but you could make it impossible for them. Listen, we have, we have locks on the doors of stores and police on the street to make sure people don't shoplift. Uh, there shouldn't be anything controversial about preventing people from pirating music, pirating video. Uh, even if people have come to expect that that's their birthright. I mean, as you said, this is only the last 20 years, and that can be changed. It can be changed, but I've talked to people who've said, look at if the fact that I know the technology to get this stuff for free is your problem, not mine. Uh, this is the business model you've come up with, and if I'm simply taking advantage of it, well, good for me. How do you push back against that? Well, again, I wouldn't push back. I mean, I think some level of moral persuasion might be good, and that was part of the point of my book, is to show people, like, artists are real. Artists are real people. Uh, the other end of the supply chain for art is not corporations, it's individuals. So we've had a consumer movement. We have a consumer movement in food uh, where we've become more aware of the consequences of cheap food, and now people talk about fast fashion and sweatshops in Bangladesh and Vietnam and becoming a more conscious consumer, so we can do that. But what I'm really saying is this whole free economy is a chimera. It's an illusion. It's built on uh, diversion of funds. It's built on venture capital money. I mean, you look at Uber as an example, not in the arts, but it's propped up with uh, an ocean of venture capital money, and it's selling its its rides at a loss, right? We can do something about that, not as individuals, but as governments. Let me ask you about the education world. Do you think that there's a role for, I don't know, elementary, high school, post-secondary, to, to put a greater accent on the appreciation of art so that by the time these young people become adults, they will already be into a a sense that this has value and I need to pay something for it. 
I think that's a great point. I think that's absolutely right. At least in the United States, these sort of assessment regimes, testing regimes, have driven arts education out of primary and secondary school to a very great extent in favor of the things that you can give people a test on, basically math and reading. But let, So I think greater arts education, greater appreciation for the arts, and not just because it'll make people pay much for art later down the road, but because it's really enriching for them. It's, I would say, a human right to have that kind of education. But let me say something else about primary and secondary education that really grew out of my interviews. With amazing consistency, my subjects said not only that they felt born to be artists, they knew they were artists from a very, very young age, but they got an enormous amount of resistance to being artists from their family, from their peers, from their society, their environment, and also from their schools. Schools seem to have a very difficult time, especially in our age of assessment regimes, recognizing the value of artistic children, especially if they don't also happen to have academic, you know, standard high achieving academic ability. So they're told that they're dumb. They're told that they're lazy. Uh, they're, they're, they're stigmatized. Um, they're not encouraged. They're not recognized as having tremendous value, but a different kind of value from, you know, your sort of typical valedictorian type. Um, I think I think it's one of the it's one of the reasons that uh, that genuine artists get derailed at a very young age and never have a chance to give us the gifts of their talent. But I think it's also a tremendous loss for society um, because these people have something unique to offer. Yeah, the people you were interviewing in the book were not exactly the Barack Obamas who get eight-figure book deals. You were dealing with the exact opposite <laughs> end of the spectrum. It's and I did wonder when you were talking to them, how much did they appreciate the fact that someone with your reputation was taking the trouble to listen to their issues and to try to find a way forward for them? Well, I think they appreciate it a lot. And, I, and, and since the book came out, I've been getting emails to that effect. And it's incredibly gratifying to me. I mean, I don't look at myself as any kind of savior. Um, it was a profound experience for me to talk to these people. And we talked, you know, I would ask them for an hour and sometimes we'd end up going two hours. Because uh, when you ask people for their stories, you know, they, they, a real connection happens when you just listen to people's experiences. And yeah, they were really grateful to have somebody do that uh, and have somebody advocate for them. I mean, artists are really good at advocating for themselves when they are able to find the time to do it. And many of them are advocating in organizations for themselves. But a lot of, a lot of especially the younger artists that I talk to, it's just all they can do to keep their nostrils above water. So, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, one of the reasons I wrote the book is because I wanted artists to have something to hold up and say, hey, Mom and Dad and everybody else, this is what I'm going through, and you need to pay some attention to that. Let's do one more excerpt from the book. You write, artists are resented for daring to follow their dreams, for supposedly avoiding adult responsibilities. Who are they not to suffer like the rest of us? At the same time, the artist's life is glamorized, romanticized, treated as a fantasy or wish fulfillment, a vision of freedom and pleasure and play. Um, I, you know, we, we sort of... Um, called that the double-edged sword. You know, the on the one hand, they do love the bohemian lifestyle to a certain extent. On the other hand, you know, reality bites. Do they not want the freedom and the pleasure and the play and all of that as part of their lives? Sure, of course they do. Of course they do. And that's what's gratifying about being an artist, and that's why people continue to do it. I think what I'm getting at in that passage is the enormous misconceptions we have about who artists are. Because that's, I mean, in that section of the book, I talk about our stereotypes of artists. They're like lazy weirdos who are kind of self-indulgent. And then the reality of what artists actually have to be like, aside from talented, which is something that doing these interviews really brought home to me in a way that I hadn't recognized before. Artists, first of all, are incredibly hardworking. They're also the opposite of dreamy, they're uh, strong-willed, determined, focused, resilient. Uh, a, the, a life in the arts is a life of almost constant rejection. Making art is a life of almost constant self-doubt. So these people are really tough. Uh, they're willing to do without. And they're also really generous, especially with each other and really with all of us. 
Hmm. That's what I. That's another thing that I want people to understand is what it really takes, um, and and what it's really like. You definitely did that. So I have one last question for you here, and that is. Well, you claim you are not an artist, despite the fact that you're a published author. Okay, we'll grant you that. But <laughs> if, you, if you were able to have been born with what you consider to be an artistic gift, what do you wish it would have been? Well, I mean, I'm a writer, so I wish that I had the ability to write novels. I was a sad young literary man who wanted to write novels. But you know what? Um, I realized later, once I had actually met some novelists, that I was never going to be a novelist. Because... Um, these people, like, they're really good at telling stories. They're really good at remembering stories. They're, they have stories running through their heads all the time. And I realized, like, that's just not who I am. Like, I think in terms of ideas. And so I write in terms of ideas. But I've also realized, like, that's okay. Um, I think part of what I don't like about this fetishization of creativity or of the artist is that there are lots of other valuable things to be also. Uh, we don't all have to be artists to have the self-respect that we want to have. That's a nice place to leave it. The Death of the Artist, How Creators Are Struggling to Survive in the Age of Billionaires and Big Tech. And we're so glad that it has brought William Derezowitz to our virtual studio anyway tonight. Thanks for joining us from Portland, Oregon. Thank you very much. And that is the agenda for Monday, November 30th, 2020. It's World AIDS Day tomorrow, so we'll check in on the science of finding a cure. And as Canada sees another year of rising rates of infection, we'll examine what's driving the increase and what communities need to cope with and stop the spread of the disease. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.